So we do have, oh. There you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah, it's, you it's working. Range, Can everyone hear me? Well, if you're in the back, thumbs up. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this is important. Um, and since there are five panelists and we only have an hour, I'm gonna try and speak as little as possible in order to facilitate this conversation. Um, and so I'm really, really excited. And so thank you all for coming. And so I think we can start um, closest to me and then go down and then I'll start with like kind of our first question. Yeah, but thank you for coming. stories about black women's hair that's loosely based around black women's hair and it deals with broader themes of uh, family, place, and belonging uh, wrapped around the vestiges of racism uh, and some classism too. Uh, it's a mix of fiction and creative nonfiction. And thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Ben Passmore. I feel like I'm really loud anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I live in Philly. Uh, I did a comic called Your Black Friend. Uh, I do a series called Day Glow A Hole. Uh, it's up for an outstanding series. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you voted for me. <laughs> 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 That's right. <laughs> I'm shameless. Um, the, uh, your Black Friend is about um, black alienation, um, maybe embodied in your friend if you don't have any black friends. That's another book. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's a whole nother book. Um, and Day Glow A Hole is a, uh, is a, uh, a fictionalized post-event uh, New Orleans uh, in which I live. Uh, I live in Philly now, but I used to live there. Uh, and I, in, in that comic, I am uh, sad and alienated and addicted to pornography and harassed by performance artists and police. Um, those parts are true. Um, <laughs> And then I, I do uh, regular work for the NIB, uh, writing about uh, con political concepts um, around uh, anti-fascism, uh, prison abolition, uh, police abolition, uh, and gentrification. So yeah. Cool. Um, OK, sorry, I wasn't sure how, how close to how quiet am I? Okay. Um, I'm Bianca Yuniz. Uh, I'm pretty sure for those who follow me online, you've always wondered how to say that out loud. So it's Yuniz and not Zunis. I get that a lot and it drives me crazy. Um, like Ben, um, I write about being black. Um, and then, but I also write for the Nib and I do political stories there about uh, police brutality, I actually won an Ignatz in 2017 for my story about police brutality in Chicago um, and my personal experience. I have that comic at my table if you would like to purchase it, um, along with other uh, collections of stories about my blackness and things like that. Um, but also, I do a lot of weird things. Um, I'm like a punk goth black girl, so a lot of my comics talk about that and living in that community, existing in that community, and like uh, and a community that talks about you know inclusivity and, and still being an outsider um, as a black woman. So there's that. So there's a lot of cool things. I'm like on both ends. I write about music. I have a comic about misfits on my table too, if you guys are interested in that. And then I also have like my slice of life things. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Helton Piskett, and I'm a Danish cartoonist. I made a trilogy about my father's life. Uh, the first one is about being in jail in Turkey and fleeing your country. The second one is about being a guest worker in Scandinavia. And the last one is about being a criminal immigrant in Denmark and eventually becoming a Danish citizen. And I tried to make the three books to portray the different kinds of um, migration we have in Denmark and different kinds of being foreign in Europe. Yeah. Yep. Sounds great. 
Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, so our panel today is called Image, Activism, and Autobiography. I just wanted to start off by, I wonder if everyone could talk maybe a little bit more about how exactly you balance putting like your own life narrative into these stories. Like, I, I noticed, well, um, well, Ben was like putting it all on the line, what some of his stuff was about, and like he's going, is there still like a fear of like exposing too much of yourself? Like what, it, is there a line that you won't cross? Like what, how do you balance that while still telling maybe like a compelling story? I can answer that. Um, to me, for first, first comes the story, like it's important that it's an interesting story and then even when stuff is based on interviews, it doesn't really matter if the story doesn't work. But I come from a background with activism so it's important that there is some sort of political agenda behind it. But for that to work or for that to change people's minds that I don't already agree with, it has to be a good story. Uh, and I think to me that's, that's, the, that's the line. And it's the moment you start turning it into a story, it's already some sort of fiction. And only the people who actually live those lives knows what reality is. The, the story that's the most true is the is called Hot Home, the short story, and it's about the um, my first perm. And so when I did it, I wasn't expecting it to show it to people. Um, so my my intention for making that comic was just to make it. I was doing uh, my dissertation at the time, and so I needed another kind of creative outlet that wouldn't be scrutinized so much like uh, academic work is. And so um, I didn't think about what other people would say because there weren't other people <laughs> to think about. Um, and, and so when, I, uh, when it came to a point where this was going to be a book and it was going to be published by Dawn and Quarterly, I was nervous about putting Hot Comb in there because um, my dad is in it, and, and my uh, brother, you know, my family's in it, and we're, we're very close. Um, and I have a scene where uh, my dad is spanking me with a, a stick, which is, I guess is considered now like child abuse, but back then it's just like what discipline looked like um, in my neighborhood. Um, and so I waited until after it was published and, and after I got my set of copies um, to my house and then um, after, and then when my dad um, came to visit me, I live in Denver now, I'm uh, originally from around here in uh, Baltimore. And so he visited me in, I think, May because I was uh, pregnant and about to give birth to his grandchild, and so I said, okay, this is a good time to tell him. <laughs> um, and so, you know, he's a very sensitive guy. I mean, he's he's a big guy, but very sensitive. And, and so I had to, like, you know, sit him down and tell him. And it became a joke, you know. That, like, before, like, years ago, we talked about, um, you know, his child rearing and how he did what he did because that's what he that's what happened to him when he was growing up. So that, that was his understanding of how to raise children. And it wasn't until later that um, he realized that there are other ways of doing discipline. And so, I mean, after that, it was, it was pretty lighthearted. It, even though it's like, in the story, it's, it looks pretty serious, but um, we were joking about it. So anyway, so it turned out okay. So I'm glad I waited. <laughs> Uh, I was having a conversation maybe at TCAF with some people about um, why so many, uh, like, there's a lot of, like, Christian movies and music. Like, when I was growing up, I listened to DC Talk. I don't know if there's any other DC Talk heads out there. Um, yeah. Jesus Freak, nobody. Um, so we are talking about, like, why it's really bad. Um, would, independent of, like, whether or not you're into that specific monotheistic religion or its tenets or its adherents. Um, in a, and one of the things I was thinking about, because also I remember when I was coming up, I got 
I was coming up in the Bush administration, there was a lot of like punk political comics, uh, World War III, Peter Cooper, stuff like that. A lot of it, Peter Cooper was good, but a lot of it was really, really bad. It was like really, really cringy. And I think some of it, and I think it relates to what you were saying, a lot of it is like really self-indulgent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it doesn't, like if for me, like a good story, like when I read sci-fi, the hardest sci-fi for me to read is sci-fi that doesn't feel like it's a lived world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like political, like political work, or like in in auto, and also just like auto bio work, it has to sort of, for me, it has to like recognize or represent sort of like, uh, like a lived, like wavering experience. Like for me, like like when I do comics for the Nib, I'm an anarchist, um, and I'm writing for the Nib, which is um, the editors are largely liberal. Like uh, most of the contributors are liberal <coughs> and white, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was an intentional punchline, but um, <laughs> but uh, so so for me, I'm already coming from like a highly peripheral experience, uh, and I think it would be easy for me, being in a position where I am like the maybe like one of the few people advocating for my particular political point of view, to be like, this is a really great idea. Look at my like beautiful utopian ideals that have like no setbacks or are not complicated by anything. Um, so for me, it's like uh, I try to make comics for like when, uh, particularly like when I do something about police abolition, I, I hate cops. I don't want there to be any cops. I think there are a lot of good models in the world for a world without police. That being said, when I talk to other anarchists about it, you know what I mean? We're not just like, oh, what a, what a great seamless idea that will have no complications, you know? <laughs> so, um, so that's what the comics I try to make. Because also, uh, I feel like you don't, I feel like in the United States, I don't know about a lot of other places, I'm too broke to travel. Um, but in the United States, I feel like it was interesting like watching Black Lives Matter pop up and there was like a generation of kids that were coming out of college that were really into that. And um, something that felt really interesting to me, it really, it became really obvious that people were heavily influenced by the spectacle, like documentaries, uh, books, like music about civil rights era, like, um, like that, that like halcyon period of black radicalism. Um, and their main understand it seemed like their main understanding about how shit happened was like you give a really cool speech. You know what I mean? <laughs> you have your Fred Hampton moment and then the and then like cops pee themselves and they're like, oh shit, maybe you are human. And it's like you know what I mean? It's like uh, and that's that's not like really true. So for me, like a big part of it was just putting myself um, you know, because I, because whatever, I'm out here. I'm, I'm, I'm at the march. I'm at the riot. You know what I mean? No snitching. That's an important thing. Don't snitch on yourself, um, ever. Uh, but also in political environments. Um, but you know, it's like it's important for me to. I like. I'm here. These are my varied experiences. Uh, and you don't. I'd much rather people enter these spaces being like, okay, this space is complicated. Uh, it's a work, like it's a, it's like sort of a proving ground for ideas. And I need to do a lot of different things. Uh, mostly focus on like interacting with the people around me to sort of get to a mutual understanding and do some things, not, yo, let me get up on a high place and read my poetry. Um, no barbs to poetry. Barbs to poetry at the protest. Um, so yeah, for, for me, that's like, that's like a big part of it. Um, no self cheerleading, that's super boring. Mm -hmm. Oh no, Wait, I can answer another question. <laughs> It is hard to sometimes show people because, you know, or your own kids, hopefully they're going to be okay with, with the way you depicted that experience. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I don't really know how my community is going to completely react to it back home um, because I do write about some of the difficult struggles that we have with, like, 
poverty, violence, um, police carding, and like different things that have been used to try to, uh, you know, displace certain communities um, to build condominiums and developments and like make room for these new kind of, I don't know, like economic migration kind of happens when land value goes up. So, um, yeah, it, it's hard to say, um, but I think uh, I felt like a conversation had to be started for me in both of those zones in terms of uh, in my own life um, around, I guess, depression and then uh, around kind of community change and renewal and that sometimes it's not just the upside that we have to talk about downside with the upside. I, I, I'm reminded of a, like an example of going through editing with my comic, and we used all the high point points of this, like based on interviews with my fathers, and I used all the high point points, and he used to be the person in Denmark who was one of the few people who made sure that there was cannabis in Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of high points, and there were guns, and there was money, and all these things, and I remember sitting and reading it through, and we had to do something so normal people could relate to this story because uh, the most important thing to me, so it doesn't turn into propaganda, is that I can read some people that I'm maybe not agreeing with in my normal life and I don't normally talk to. So we had these, these scenes that we started calling pancake scenes, which would be Sunday scenes where everyone is sitting down and the guns are nowhere in sight and people are eating pancakes and having a good time. Um, and, and I mean, these scenes never took place in reality, and to me, they became, what do you say, they became scenes that were there for the, for the viewer to see that it was a normal life that was lived, but also for the people that was interviewed, to, they, they could see very visually that these scenes never took place, so they, they knew that this story was a fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I just think you need to, as someone who works with political stuff, I think you need to make the characters, like you say, like the world, but the people need to be real as well, because it's not, no matter how hard your life is, there is also pancakes on the Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good segue into kind of what I was wanting to talk about next, because I imagine there are a lot of people who, um, in the audience, that either make comics or like to make comics that would probably like to tackle some of these big, because I was struck by re reading and rereading everyone's work. Everyone here tackles some of the big, like big subjects all the time, white supremacy, racism, gentrification, classism, all sorts of things all the time. But they're mostly told through these intimate stories that are, of, are juxtaposed with like very almost like, I don't know, private moments sometimes. How, what's the process like to creating something like that? Do you set out to be, to make this big profound statement with issues? Like how, like how if I was, you know, just starting out, what would I do? Because I know I, in my head I probably have these ideas. I'm going to make this big comic that's going to make this statement. But I'm like, these comics are doing it and they're also like so real. And so just like... I immediately get it because they're talking about things like, I don't know, like having a baby, going to the store, those kind of things. Like, how do you how do you do that? Because it seems to me it seems like magic, but maybe <laughs> you can, I all can explain some of that magic to us. Well, I would, so I'm gonna be honest here. So uh, when I was asked to be on this panel, I was a little confused because I I, I don't see myself as being an activist. I mean, honestly, I, I was joking around, I'm going to say it. I was joking <laughs> around with uh, some of my friends, but <laughs> I was just like, you know, I'm in my underwear making comics and eating Doritos. <laughs> That's how these comics came about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when I'm doing a comic and, and creating stories, I don't sit there and think, how can I be provocative or how can I include these major themes that just, that's what happens um, in, in making the stories. And um, I'm happy that people see my work in, in certain ways and, and seeing it as being provocative and being activist oriented. But um, when I'm sitting down, I, I just want to make a good story and I want to make stories that I want to see on the bookshelf and in libraries. And it just so happens that the books I want to see are about black people and black women specifically. And, and, and about regular black people, so not exceptional ones. Um, so, you know, there's no magic, no one's flying. 
<laughs> where they're trying to save something of her night. They're just trying to live their lives. Um, and yeah, so that's what Hot Home is about. It's just regular people just living every day. Um, and I hope that you know more people are inspired to, to make basic story, <laughs> but basic in a good way, not the other way. Um, just to, like you know, stories about everyday living and every everyday lives um, from perspectives that, especially in comics, that you don't typically see all the time. But without sitting down and, and saying that's what I'm going to do, because then that's for me that would be weird. But it might work for other people. But I I never sit down and say I'm going to make a story about racism. <laughs> um, to kind of jump off of what Ebony's saying, um, I kind of like being born a black woman, I kind of had no choice not to be radical because existing as a black woman already is a political act. Like it's just like you, everybody throws so much at you just living your life. Like um, one of the comics that I've done that you guys can read on the nib or I have at my, my table is about the first time I got called the N-word and it was, I was in kindergarten when it happened. So like there was never like this time in my life where I was like, oh, I get to live a life as a normal child. <laughs> you know, it, like racism was thrown at me like out of the womb basically. And so um, I find um, kind of like what Ebony is saying, writing stories about the mundane, writing stories about my day-to-day, -day, writing stories about my mental illness um, is a protest, is political, because I'm showing a world that people almost feel like doesn't exist. Like I was making a joke the other day about sometimes I feel like white people don't think black people exist when we're not in their scene. Like we just fade into the darkness when we're not like talking to them at the line at Target or something. Like we're just like, and then we're gone. Versus like, then we go to our homes and have our children and our family and our brothers and our sisters and our lives and our regular just eating bread and peanut butter lives. And not everything that we experience are these sort of big moments. Um, when I came into comics, um, like as, as you guys can probably see, I, I dressed a little strange. Um, and I was always kind of on the internet. That was kind of what I was doing before. Like I was just like taking pictures of my outfits and people were like, oh, you're, you're black and you're like punk and goth, that's cool. Like keep doing this. And I was like, okay. So I kept, kept doing that. And <laughs> eventually I was like, this is fun, but it felt hollow and I didn't like like the fashion industry, like I would get asked to go to New York Fashion Week and all these type of things. I was like, this isn't my scene. Um, it's just like, I kind of just felt like this novel thing. And I remember when um, Trayvon Martin was killed, um, I was still doing kind of just like the fashion work. And I was like, I remember when uh, the jury um, let uh, Zimmerman go. Um, I like had no passion for fashion anymore. <laughs> Not to make a, a rhyme there. Um, but I just felt like this is so stupid. Like I hate this where social media is going where we're just taking pictures of ourselves and looking cute. I'm like, there's the, we should be doing something. We have to do something. And for a while I was like, what can I do? What can I do? And I always did my comics, but my comics um, were more of just like, again, like slice of life, kind of just regular situations um, and awkward situations. Um, but I was like, I just, I need to, I need to say something. I need to, to, you know, just, I was just feeling so uneasy about everything. And um, I didn't uh, just, I don't know, just everything just felt so, just so Zacharin and everybody just kind of complacent into our situation and part of me was like oh I should start a punk band but I can't sing so I was like <laughs> maybe not that um but I was like but I still want like just something out there and I started um slowly integrating more political statements in my work I had a a column on Hello Giggles like five, six years ago called Bianca's Drawing Room. And it used to be more like, oh, you know, when your pants don't fit and like boring, <laughs> like basic stuff like that. And I was like slowly making them more radicalized until they got bought up by Yahoo and then kicked me off the team. <laughs> um, and then, uh, but yeah, like I, there was this moment that I, I had this little mini comic that posted on my Twitter where I talk about, um, this moment I had in my therapist's office where I'm like holding onto my sketchbooks and I'm crying 
And I'm like, no one cares about a story about a black girl. I don't see these stories. Like every time I read indie comics, it's like some R. Crumb craziness with like, you know, his penis is swinging around or whatever. I'm like, ah. I'm like, okay, but I want like to have that same sort of cavalier attitude, but as a black woman. And I was like, but I don't see this out there, so nobody wants it. That's why it hasn't existed. Um, and I was like, just push yourself and push your stories and put it out there. And I wasn't feeling challenged by my work earlier, and I was like, I just want to challenge my own art. Um, and I started, you know, talking about more political things and things that are happening in my life. And again, just like anything from talking about getting denied by my crush to um, police brutality that I experienced to, you know, having days or months where I can't get out of bed because my depression's so bad. Like, these are conversations that black people don't get to have. We, like, hardly see these movies. Our movies are still green book. They're still making, like, white savior movies where, like, the white guy's like, I figured it out. Like, you're saying, but black people are real. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> like, if I had to see, like, another Sam Rockwell racist movie, I'm gonna scream. Um, but I just, I just, like, I want that. Like, Moonlight, I did a comic um, with Sage Coffee, who's floating around um, about representation at the Nib. And it talks about, like, I want stories like Lady Bird or Sixteen Candles or just something average, but with black and brown and queer kids and not, like, queer baited children and, you know, a sassy friend in the background. It's like, you get your man, girl. Like, no. Like, I, I want the man. I don't want to be, like, a sexless background character. Like, black people have sex. That's why, there's, that's why we keep showing up. Because we're like, <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine it's just a white dude needs help? We're like, oh, I'm right. <laughs> I got you, brother. <laughs> this is Ben's next comic. <laughs> Black people do exist. <laughs> I'm good after that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was watching The Good Place recently. Y'all watch that? Yeah. Veronica Mars is in it. Um, <laughs> you remember Veronica Mars? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so there was, um, I'm about to spoil something. Is that okay? Leave the room if you don't want to hear spoilers. <laughs> um, but there was, uh, there's one part where they realize no one's going to heaven because capitalism exists and you're connected to violence through all your purchases, basically everything. Um, which I was like, all right, good place. <laughs> Talking about late stage capitalism. Um, and, uh, and I think something that's interesting is that people, ah, oh man, I have two branching uh, thoughts about this. Okay, so I think in general, people that think of themselves as political people are, are essentially living the same life unless they're being really extra and want attention and they're too focused on activism. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem, that's a job, you should stop that. Um, you should just be a real person. Um, anyway, I'll talk about that later. Um, so, uh, but something that I think you know, people, people that write about politics, I think in, a, in, in some ways, all they're doing is ex extrapolating and sort of touching on things that we already know, that we're part of systems. And uh, for me, I, I, I think being asked to do sort of explicitly sort of journalistic comics or sort of like nonfiction comics, is like an opportunity to do this thing that as a wingnut anarchist, I sort of already do where I'm like, how does the thing that I'm doing sort of connect to a system of force which is essentially what capitalism is, right? It's a mediation that's reinforced through force. Um, it's the last time I'll talk like that. Um, so the, um, so you know, so the comic is just sort of talking about that, and something that I think is important when it comes to media, because I I have up until recently felt sort of dubious about like the the comparative benefits of media that covers political topics and actually and what it actually does mm -hmm. like we have like there's some things like uh, someone is out outed as a fascist and then there's real world repercussions for that person so that seems good but there is a tendency like particularly when your black friend came out people were asking me these questions i was like y'all ask james baldwin these questions and if james baldwin did not convince you i don't know what i'm going to say it's just going to be the same thing in pictures and less capitalist you know um, and less articulate. So, so anyway, so there's that. I think, um, 
What was I talking about? Extrapolation, James Baldwin. <laughs> um, So anyway, so I think, I think it's like, the thing that is important is that we're sort of like making these connections that already exist, but I think it, it's important. So something that I was gonna say about activism, I, I have like a, like a personal sort of like a uh, feeling, but I end up on these panels and that's fine and I understand why. The thing that I have uh, an issue with activism is that, it, and it's the same thing as organizer in a political context, um, often these become sort of just like identities that you put on your Tinder profile. Uh, and um, you know, we all live in the world and uh, there's some people that feel sort of empowered to take action and often in the United States these become highly ritualized actions, right? How many protests you go to and you're like, I guess the protest is over, put my sign away and nothing really happened, right? Yeah. And a part of you is like, well, I have to go to the protest because this is part of the good work. That's part of our like weird Joe Do, Christian inheritance, that's Hegel, whatever. I said I'd stop talking about that stuff. Um, so I guess what's important to me is to not think of myself as an activist. I am Ben, I am, I am um, you know, I, I have a certain uh, <laughs> uh, racial sort of relationship to society. Uh, I have a whole bunch of other kinds of subjectivities that, that means that the world is responding to me a certain way. Uh, I am predisposed for that reason to not like fascists. I don't like cops. These are deeply emotional responses to me and I understand that there's a whole bunch of like systems that need to be analyzed in that. Um, but I think, you know, this, this idea, I think it, we're all more effective if we are seeking to live in good communities that talk to each, in which we are talking to each other through art, through conversation about how we be freer rather than trying to create careers out of advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, because this weird distance happens, like I'm an activist, you're not an activist, and you get in this weird cycle where it's like, maybe I should be an activist. Am I going to the meetings? You shouldn't, the meetings are incredibly boring. Um, and nothing's really happening. Don't go to the meetings. Find a way that is actually gonna be more effective for you to feel freer. Um, so, you know, hopefully comics helps that. And I guess the, my approach generally, and which I, I guess is going back to what I was saying before, I, um, I'm, I'm conscious, particularly it's interesting, uh, just having been an, an anarchist since high school, and it's a politic where it's like, theoretically you're like, well, if I don't believe in the government and I don't believe in institutions, fuck, that means I have to do it. But I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> but the force is internal, it's like, okay, well, I have to do it. And, and then the question is like, how do I do it? And I feel it's sort of interesting, it's like after Trump and like the, the very like visible spectacle of like, uh, alt-right people and like Nazis and stuff, people were like, well, what, what do I do, you know? Uh, and for me, it was really fortunate. Uh, Antifa really came back in a big way, and there was, there, was, there was kids dressed like ninjas punching Nazis, and you're like, well, <laughs> there you go. That's like, that is a thing you could do as part of a, you know, a system, um, you know, theoretically. Um, so for me, that's, that's the connection. It's like, uh, for me, when I'm making something, I'm trying to give people enough information to sort of like, and it's the information I have to try to figure out like how to act um, and not to sort of perform uh, my, my relative wokeness. I talked a while, that's it. Um, I kind of wanted to add a little bit more to that, whereas um, in my approach to my work, I don't necessarily always try to write about my blackness, it's just that um, we currently exist in the world where I'm reminded of it all of the time that I'll start writing a comic about peanuts and then it'll <laughs> turn into a comic about my blackness and I'm like, not again, but <laughs> <laughs> it kind of always, it just takes over. Um, but at the same time, like my, my protest in my work is I kind of don't respond to those emails I get um, on January, what is it, 20th, saying like, hey, Black History Month is coming up, <laughs> and we would love if you would write a comic about black history. Like, it's like one of those things where I like, don't just call me to be the token black person in the room to talk about my blackness and only exist under trauma and pain and brutality. Like, again, I, I don't, like, in my brain, I'm never, like, thinking about, like, I'm black, I'm black. I'm, like, thinking about, like, I don't know, cartoons or pizza. All the, from Chicago, I'm always thinking about pizza, almost all, but, like, Tavern Square pizza. <laughs> um, 
That's another conversation for another day. Um, <laughs> but uh, so my protest is to like, well, I won't do that, but um, you can still pay me to write a comic about, um, like a comic I did recently was about um, a pink wig that I bought uh, at Joanne Fabrics uh, when I was in high school. I grew up very religious. Um, my parents were club kids and then the 90s happened and they got caught up in all like the TV evangelism and we all got saved. Um, and so <laughs> like everything was the devil and I like have no connection to like 90s pop culture. Like I didn't know about the Spice Girls until people pointed at me and called me Scary Spice and I was like, well, I'm gonna go look up this. And I was like, oh, we look the same. Um, <laughs> But like I like missed a lot. Of, like I have a comic about this. Like people are like, who's your favorite Baxter boy? And I'm like Kyle. Uh. <laughs> but my my mom was like, anything from her generation was like fine, but anything from my generation was the devil. So that's how I got into like punk and goth music because I was like, well, can I listen to Susie Sue? And she was like, uh, yeah, that's clean. Um, so um, when I was in high school, I wasn't allowed to celebrate Halloween. I celebrate. I went trick or treating for the first time last year with my niece, um, and it was amazing because they give you beer when you're an adult. <laughs> so I was like, "Wow!" Um, so I bought this pink wig um, from the Halloween section, and I like asked my mom if I could have it. She wouldn't let me like cut and dye my hair like I wanted to, and she was like, "Sure." And so this comic goes through this journey of like me having this pink wig and like putting on like all the pins and stuff. And she like helped me because she was again like a punk when she was younger. And um, and then going to school, I grew up in an all black neighborhood. Um, and kids being like, "Oh, you can't. You, that's that's white people shit. Like you can't do that." And like being like devastated. So again, like a comic about. Um, punk music and Christianity and all these things still ended up being about my blackness, but I'm not gonna like draw a comic about Martin Luther King. Even though like if, if his daughter asked or something, I'd be like, okay, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like not gonna like, you know, be like the token black person in the room that's like, oh, like here we go. Like it's, it's racism's over now because <laughs> Obama happened, I don't know. Did that not do it? It didn't do it. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> oh, we, we did get asked to do a comic about Obama. I forgot about that. <laughs> we did. We got asked to a comic about what Obama meant to us, um, and that was a very that was like when black ca cartoonists like came together and said en enough. Enough with <laughs> yeah. Obama. I feel like what there was a thread, and then someone, not me, I think it was Ron Wimberly, said, "Isn't Obama just like a cop on a skateboard?" <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the thread broke down from there. We didn't make it. <laughs> we didn't make it. And then Nim was like, they didn't realize. I'm like, oh, black people feel different about Obama. <laughs> They're not the same. Yeah, I feel, yeah. I feel bad for Matt, but we like we opened that third. We were like, hey, we got to talk to you about this. But it's been better so since. So yeah, I did a comic about Martin Luther King. Sorry. <laughs> not for the. I did do it for the new. Who else has it? I've, I've clear, yeah, I would I've love a comic about Martin Luther King when he's like cheating on his wife. Like, let's talk about that. Oh, no, for real? Yeah. For I've real? clearly lost lost track of this panel. That's okay. <laughs> um, it's that's all right. I was just letting. I just enjoying it. Um, I did though. Bianca's comments made me think of, especially the pink wig, and um, talking so much about maybe the visibility of Black women made me think about how autobiography in general, and doing a comic autobiography uh, rather than other like maybe written forms of autobio, you have to be kind of like be doing this continuous set of self portraits over and over and over again. And I was um, looking at um, Sylvia's work last night, for example, and where you choose to represent yourself as more of like, almost like this ghostly outline person. Um, and then, but everyone on this panel also has to en engage with some level of abstraction to draw yourselves. I wondered if y'all could maybe speak some more about that and maybe that process and like the, the decision to draw or what not to draw and how to like simplify that. But then 
it, um, some of them have more specificity, or mm -hmm. there'll be certain panels where you know it's an emotional moment, and it's like all of a sudden you you have intimacy with the character in terms of how you see the character. So they transform from being something fairly abstract and formless into being like kind of a fully realized thing. And yeah, I just kind of use that as a tool to explore how we often are. In that story, I mean, in Creation, which is the book um, here at SPX, I, uh, I guess I never draw my own face in that book. The narrative is kind of a fictionalized version of me, so my voice. Um, and uh, the portrait, I guess, is you know the book itself. So I never actually yeah, draw my own, my own face. So, yeah. <laughs> Very um, uh, I first learned to draw by my old boss, uh, Linda Berry, who was also a cartoonist. Oh, wow. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer as well. Uh, yes. In my comic, I, it's three books, and I think on page 350 out of 400 pages, uh, I'm born, and mm -hmm. then I'm in the comic as well. But the entire, <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, the entire story is from my father's perspective, mm -hmm. and all the way through, it was important to me that uh, it really shouldn't be about me, and that's in general with working politically, it's it has to be about uh, something a little bigger than yourself at least to me. Uh, and the same with my father's story. This, like, it can't be purely personal for him. It, and he, uh, every time there was like, uh, if, a per if he's in jail and being tortured, I have to look up how it was for other people to be tortured. Mm -hmm. if, um, if he has a specific story about coming to Denmark and being a guest worker, I needed to hear from other people that this was not his personal uh, view on it. It has, it has to be some sort of universal, at least to me. Um, 
But I mean, I made a lot of self-published comics when I was 18, and I was really surprised that I was having sex and I was going out on all these things. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, a good story, then it's just a good story, then it doesn't matter who the lead character is. And it is your own voice, so you're already using your voice, so however you, who's saying it doesn't really matter. You're mm -hmm. still the person making it, and yeah. Yes, and I, um, I have, I'm afraid we're at time now, so thank you all very much for being here. Um, thank you so much, wonderful panelists, that was incredible. <laughs>